Protect your wooden clarinet and get the most out of your reeds with Bovada two-way humidity control packs. Watch until the end of this video to learn more. Then head to bovadainc.com and use code CLARINET at checkout to save 10% on your next purchase of Bovada products. Hi, I'm Sean Perrin, and you're listening to the Clarinet Podcast, the show for clarinetists. And today I'm joined by Josh Gu from Quick Start Clarinet. You might recognize him from YouTube and, and social media. Um, and he's coming to us today from Colorado in the United States. Josh, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's always fun to, to get to chat and catch up with you. So I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. And you know, this is Josh's second episode on the podcast, I believe. And um, he's one of those guests I feel like I could just talk to all day. He's got so many insights into clarinet education. He keeps busy within the community. And uh, I think you're even heading to Clarinet Fest this year. So maybe we'll have to touch on that, some of your goals there. And if you could say hi to everyone for me there, that'd be great because I haven't been in years at this point. But uh, <laughs> so let's get started off the top. So it's been a few years since we connected. I believe it was either just before or just during the pandemic that we first had an interview. But a lot has changed since then. A lot of time has somehow passed. So let's get a quick update from you. Yeah, yeah. It's been really exciting. Uh, lots of stuff uh, developing for me. Uh, the YouTube channel is growing, which is really fun and exciting. Uh, I've sort of overhauled and created some new products and, and different things, which has been great. Last time, I think we talked a good bit about the Next Generation Clarinet Method, which is my sort of online method book program. And I think last time we talked was just after version two came out. Uh, and then at the end of 20. 21 or 2022 it was 2021 <laughs> i updated to version 3 and added like over 160 videos to it so now you can be in the pdf version and just like click the little play icon next to the exercise and see not just me playing it uh, i feel like a lot of method books have like a demo playing of it which is nice and helpful to give you an idea of the goal um, but i actually talk about how to be practicing it how to get the most out of it as well as playing it and demonstrating how it works. So that was a really exciting update. Uh, I did a rhythm course. I have a membership program, sort of Patreon-like thing now too. So it's been a lot of fun stuff developing since the last time we talked. Do you find that business is kind of, if you want to call it business, you call it like your business or you, <laughs> yeah. Um, business is growing since people kind of shifted online for the pandemic and how has that kind of gone? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I know just sort of, being aware of the industry, I know that the online uh, education and courses and stuff really took off because of the pandemic. Um, I think it was probably headed to take off kind of anyways, and the pandemic was just a good catalyst for it. And I kind of feel the same way in my own business with that, where I think I was at a point where I was starting to gain traction and starting to come out with really great products. So it was probably about to take off anyways. And then I think the pandemic sort of was a good catalyst for it too. Yeah, I said that a while ago to somebody, you know, I know that the pandemic seems to have caused a real serious shift to online and digital ordering and, and you know, getting your groceries online and DoorDash or whatever, all these different things, right? Um, especially with music too, like it was forced online for a while and everyone became a content creator for a little while. Um, it was kind of the only way to be a musician. But I, f I think that really, you're right, it kind of accelerated something that was already very much in motion. And I think that we kind of jumped ahead about 10 years in three years. And that was very jarring for a lot of people, myself included. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, it, it worked out well for me because pretty much from the beginning, I had scaling in mind. So it, luckily, mm -hmm. it wasn't too overwhelming uh, with the, the increase. But yeah, I was really welcomed to, to have that. The pandemic was not welcomed, but the yeah. <laughs> uh, benefits from that were, were nice. And I think there were just so many people who had nothing to do now and were looking online for different things and maybe they had music as a small hobby and then it became a much more significant hobby um, after that, yeah. Well, it's interesting you talk about the scalability and I think that's actually, I think that's, ugh, I think that's actually <laughs> a really important part of growing any business and I think it's really one of the first times sort of, I want to say in history, that musicians have actually had access to that element of running a business because you know, before you could only play at one jazz club at a time. You can only interact with so many people at once. But there's a guy I watch on YouTube. Um, I'm not even sure he's really a great 
you know, I don't want to say a great player, but he, he, he makes his fair share of blunders. And, but his YouTube channel is kind of focused around that. Like, he's a sax player, and he's kind of just filming his experience playing on cruise ships and all the ups and downs and good and bad. And he's you know, actually good on him for broadcasting the stuff that he's screwing up along with the stuff that he's doing well. Because that's what's gaining traction. He has like 350,000 subscribers now. But I was thinking to myself how cool it is that that guy is able to work on a cruise ship, make the wages of a cruise ship player, but then also be like scaling to a third of a million people and generating income through social media and whatever else, you know, maybe he has a Patreon, I don't know. But so musicians in this day and age, yeah, we're able to reach many, many more people and actually scale our music business, if that's the way we want to look at it, um, really for the first time outside of perhaps record sales before that might have been the only way. But then there's so many kind of hands in the pie that you know, not much is left over. So, so when you say scaling, what does that look like for you? You started off with just a few kind of online lesson clients and you realized you wanted to make a bigger impact or what kind of woke you up to that? Did you read some music business book or business book that made you realize this path or? Yeah. Yeah. There's actually a really funny story to how this started. Uh, when I was in high school and I don't know if this makes me sound young or old now. <laughs> um, but when, when I was in high school, uh, it was around the era when YouTube was really taking off. Um, PewDiePie was like blowing up as one of the biggest creators in sort of the gaming space. Uh, and my wife and I like playing video games a lot. And we actually started a gaming channel, which I will mm. not say the name of. <laughs> um, it was just is just sort of doing fun stuff and we were like oh this is going to be great we're going to have this sort of side income revenue from being youtube famous uh, and that never really took off but there were some like youtube creators that i were, was following and they sort of made the shift to the online course world and that was right when i was starting uh, my masters at northwestern i was hearing about that and thinking what is something that i'm an expert in that i could make courses on and i was like oh clarinet the, the thing that i'm getting a master's in i, I think that yeah. makes sense and <laughs> um i liked teaching a lot so it was kind of a natural fit to to move that direction and that was in 2019 i made my first courses which i no longer sell because they weren't very good um, but i sort of just kept iterating and improving things and and working through things as i've gone and it's it's been quite the journey and, and a lot of fun. Um, I, it's also interesting what you were saying about sort of the online shift with scalability for musicians. I found in my private teaching that I, I like teaching private lessons and, and working with individuals and seeing them grow. But for me, there's so much more reward and excitement to be reaching many, many people. I also find a little bit in my own teaching that I find myself saying sort of the same things over and over. And I'm not sure if my students are tired of it because they keep hearing the same thing or if it's just me getting tired of it because I'm saying it to student after student after student <laughs> week after week. Um, so it's nice to have a format that's not me having to repeat the same things over and over. I can just sort of record it once put it out in the world, and then many, many people can benefit from it. I love that. And I, you know, I relate to all that stuff maybe more than you know, because I, I was teaching a ton about, uh, I don't know, eight to 10 years ago, just before I started Clarinet. And um, I'm not sure what really made me go kind of full steam into the podcast and a career shift, but it was partly my hand injury, which was pretty brutal at the time. And But partly, yeah, the success of the podcast too, I think was kind of leaning me towards, oh, there's a different way to make an impact, you know? And um, I would experience the same thing. I, I realized the only way to start having more impact was literally to clone myself because I was full. My, my, I, there were some months I had like 27 concerts and I was teaching 30 to 40 students a week. In the early mornings, I was doing like clinics at seven o'clock. And it's just I was working like from seven until 10 every day, solidly doing music. And I just was like, the only way I can squeeze in another hour as if I'm literally cloning myself, and I don't know how to do that. <laughs> but also, I would find myself in a lesson, and I wasn't able to be as attentive as I wanted to be. And also, I literally couldn't remember if I had just said something to this student or if it was like someone three days ago. And so sometimes I would say something, wondering to myself, did this person, like, do they think I'm crazy? Did I j j literally just say that? <laughs> you know, <Right. laughs> um, Because it was just the same relevant thing that is coming up now in this lesson, and, you know... So I think that that's uh, you're really onto something as far as the online 
teaching and, and getting out there with YouTube. And it's been exciting to watch your channel grow. I remember your first push to, was it 500 or 1,000 subscribers at the time? And um, now you're well over that. You're almost at four or beyond four. What is it now? Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, coming up at 5,000 almost. Five, already. see? Yeah. Amazing. Well, and the impact yeah. a clarinetist can gain on uh, reach on YouTube is really surprising. And, you know, I was pushed into doing video for a couple of years, and I've only finally made the move, as as you can tell right now. Um, but it's hasn't even launched yet. I've got five episodes now in the can, which I need to edit and get together and get on there, which are going to be super successful, I can tell already, um, because I've been releasing some reels and I've just been astonished at the reach. I have never seen this kind of reach for clarinet content. One little reel for Sean Osborne, um, which went viral partly because of uh, mentioning Windows XP, and he played on the Windows XP soundtrack. But And I say went viral very seriously. By the time this episode airs, I'm sure it will have reached 200,000 views. It's uh, like it's. I was stunned. Like my phone, every time I open my phone, there's like a hundred likes, which is the max number. <laughs> and then I'm just mm-hmm. like, what's going on? You know, this is some guy talking about clarinet. I've reached 200,000 people. So yeah, it's great. And it's been a shift though. I mean, starting off with audio podcasts only, that was kind of my interest and passion. I had to learn how to do all this video stuff. And there's always a learning curve, always somewhere to grow. So what have you found as some challenges as you've grown this? I mean, I imagine that when you started out, you thought it if you're like me, you thought it would be kind of easy and you found a lot of challenges along the way you didn't expect. So what are some things you found? Yeah, definitely. I remember with my first courses, I was like, oh, it's going to be amazing. I just sell like a thousand courses a month and I'm going to be a millionaire. It's, it's going to be so, so nice. And I think those first courses sold like maybe 10 total, <laughs> probably less than that, actually, even. Uh, so it, it's been interesting. But I, I think the biggest lesson and takeaway that I would share for everybody, and I think as musicians, we have this skill pretty well, is persistence. And I think persistence is is the key. You just have to keep going. My personal YouTube strategy is I upload a video every week, pretty much. Uh, every week, whether it's good or bad, I just make sure that I'm getting a video out there. And some of them have done really well. Some of them haven't really done anything. But it's just doing it every week for coming up on four years now maybe five years in, in next January, uh, it's paid off uh, over the long run. Did you listen to the last episode I released with uh, John Burra, who, did yeah. you check that one out? Very yeah. relevant, I think, for, for not just what you're doing, but uh, for many other people too, I mean, who are looking to create online content. I mean, he, he was able to find a niche by stepping a little bit outside of music that was able to provide him with incredible sales. I mean, I think he's sold one and a half million courses now. And he's raised mm-hmm. multiple millions on Kickstarter. Like, it's just been shocking. And, and so, you know, that's actually an interesting thing is that even, let's say, down the line, if you were to decide that you don't want to continue the, the clarinet channel, you now have a skill that you could market something else too and or provide to other people or whatever. And I think that that's what's really nice about kind of growing. And, and uh, do you know who Evelyn Glennie is? Mm-hmm. I was talking to her yesterday. Um, she's a famous percussionist and, uh, there's another podcast I'm launching with Modacity, which we're also both kind of working with, um, Mm -hmm. called Music Mastery. So by the time this airs, that might've actually also aired. So you can check it out at uh, modacity.co slash podcast. It's called the Music Mastery Podcast. And, um, there's some, going to be some episodes of really cool stuff airing on there actually too. But anyway, she was saying something about how I asked her, you know, how did you decide you wanted to do music as a passion when you kind of fall in love with it and realize it's the only thing you want to do. And she was like, well, but I'm not like that. There's so much else I like to do. And I was like, really? Because you're, you're like so, you're like the most probably focused percussionist on the planet. But she said, you know, she really enjoys music business. And I think that's one reason she's so successful is she has not kind of pigeoned her whole, pigeonholed herself just into being a musician. She's able to learn new skills and become a touring artist and, and all these different things. So I think it's a really kind of commendable skill set but also it's a skill set worth developing have you thought about or have you because i haven't watched all 400 of your videos or whatever (laughs) there is now um but have you branched out into kind of helping other musicians market themselves online as well 
Mm, yeah, I haven't gotten into that too much yet. Uh, I'm really focused on this mission now of, of sort of fostering music and, and getting that going. It is definitely something I've considered a few times, um, but I haven't done too much of that yet. But I think it could be an interesting path for sure. So let's get into kind of your mission statement, because a while ago you contacted me and you've got this really kind of lofty goal of, I'll, I'll let you talk through it, but getting people started on a better path right away and immediately reaching higher levels on their instruments. So in your own words, what does that look like? Yeah, so I've recently been sort of reading some business kind of stuff and, and getting a little bit more business minded with with what I'm doing. And I've been reading a lot of Simon Sinek, who is the author of like, Start With Why is the, the big book. Um, also, The Infinite Game is, is another really good one that I read. And in that, he talks about being sort of mission driven and purpose driven and serving this just cause. So after reading those, that sort of inspired me to sit down and really iron out what my mission is, what I'm doing with my life, what's what's my purpose, and then also sort of the purpose of the business. And after like a whole afternoon of revising and thinking and, and getting it sorted out, I think I've really ironed out a mission statement that I'm really, really happy with. Uh, it's a little bit long, so I'll, I'll do it slowly in chunks. <laughs> <laughs> but it's inspiring a deeper understanding by simplifying the complex to minimize frustration and foster joy so that we can make more music and learn the values that make the world more beautiful. I love that. That's very well thought out. And I especially like it because it's, I feel sometimes like music is a bit of uh, sort of like gatekeeping almost like the, the people who are up there at the top, like they're just kind of there on a pedestal and they sort of just kind of look down at the rest of us, <laughs> you know, and it would be so nice if, if some of the things were a little more accessible and, and broadly taught. So what are some ways then that you're working to realize this goal? Yeah. Yeah. So actually speaking to that sort of gatekeeping feeling, that's a, a big mission of mine a lot. And uh, a part of the reason why I'm just always wearing like, jeans and a t-shirt or really casual in, in all of my videos, uh, partially because it's, it's comfortable. <laughs> but it's also just sort of having that sense of, I'm just a normal person doing my thing. Yes, I play the clarinet really well, but any normal person can play the clarinet really well. Uh, you mentioned earlier uh, sort of sharing mistakes with that, that saxophonist, and that's something that I'm really passionate about is showing really authentically what the process is like, even the professionals make mistakes. Uh, I've had this idea for years and years now, who knows if it'll actually ever come to fruition or not, uh, but sort of interviewing or connecting with a lot of professional clarinetists and writing a book called like clarinet mistakes or something like that. And just going to the professionals and saying, what's the like big thing that you've always struggled with and always continually make mistakes on or things that you're thinking about because we do have this per uh, perception that the professionals just are always great because when we hear them on the stage they're always great because that's what being a professional is but there's so much behind the scenes of things that they struggle with and think about and even if it doesn't look like it they're working really hard up there to sound as great as they do. You know, one of the new questions I've added to the lightning round, which I've, I get to if I have time at the end, but maybe I'll ask it now because it's super relevant, is uh, what was the worst piece of advice you ever got? And I kind of flipped this one on its head because of the Tim Ferriss book that I read that asked that question. Like, what is a piece of advice? I think it's called Tools of Titans or something. But he asked these people, like, what is a piece of advice in your industry which people should not follow or that is bad or whatever? And, and so I was wondering this about musicians because I... I personally myself have been given some really bad advice about some things you know someone told me when I was sharing stuff on YouTube originally that it was a terrible idea because it would ruin my career that someone might see me making mistakes in my junior recital and I was like but I just I just finished my junior recital YouTube was brand new it was 2006 or something right and literally YouTube was brand new and I had to record that on the crappiest camcorder imaginable onto a DV tape 
and move it. Like looking back, it, I can't believe that was nearly 20 years ago, but that was the process. It was pretty difficult to get it online. I went up an intermission and switched the DV ch- tape and the battery because <laughs> you know that's how you did it back then, right? And it's filmed in like 140p or something. Um, anyway, and it's it's terrible. I recently took it down because I was like, you know, it's been up for 20 years. I'm I'm done. I'm just it's seen what it's seen. But my recital reached like probably a few hundred thousand people over the, those 15 years. The stage at the event, there was probably only, I don't know, 100 people there max at the time. So was it really a bad idea to put my recital up there? I got to share my music with tens of thousands of people. And if I had not, like if I had taken that advice more seriously back then, I probably wouldn't even release any more content. But if I'd taken it less seriously, maybe I would have released more. So anyway, what, what, what's something you were kind of told that you look back and you're like, ooh, that actually wasn't a good piece of advice? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's a super interesting question. I think... I'll probably come up with like 10 better answers right after this. But what's coming to mind now is the advice that you have to like practice more than the other person to win the job. And I I think there's a few problems with that. First of all, practicing more doesn't guarantee results. Uh, You mentioned working with Modacity. That's like their whole thing is the deliberate practice and the quality of practice. And uh, that's something I wish I had gotten that advice way sooner to to go for better quality of practice. Uh, But it also has that very limited scarcity mindset of there's only this many jobs and you have to beat down everybody else in order to get your shot at having that one job. And it's just not the, the case. I think part of the reason why I'm doing quick start clarinet and all this other stuff is because honestly, if I, were playing in an orchestra, I would probably like it and enjoy it, but I think I would get kind of bored with it eventually, and it wouldn't be the most satisfying and fulfilling thing to me. So I spent all of these years trying to beat other people so I could be better and have a chance to have a career when I didn't need to be doing that. Yes, the practicing was valuable, but I don't need to beat other people to get that one job because there's so many more jobs and so many different opportunities that are more fulfilling to me. You know exactly what you're saying. It reminds me of when I was a student. It was very much based around the um, the time spent practicing. And there's nothing wrong with time spent practicing. I don't want to <laughs> put that out there. Even Modacity, like it's an app that it is based on time spent practicing, but it's also based on other elements of your practice that are important, like reflection and what did you achieve and this kind of thing. So of course you have to spend time. But there used to be this kind of myth, like you're saying, I think that 30 minutes is better than 15, when I think that five good minutes is better than 15 bad minutes, you know? Um, so anyway, when I was a kid, uh, they had you fill out practice sheets for, for band, and you had to practice four hours a month. And so in grade seven, I got top band student. I had like 100% in band or something like that. Had the amazing practice sheet, you know, 12 hours or something a month. But in grade eight, I joined a marching band. And to me, I was like, well, all the time I'm spending in band, like, is that practice? Maybe it is. So I had like 100 hours of practice on my practice sheet one month. And my parents signed off on it. And I didn't get top band student that year that year because I, he thought I was lying on the practice sheets. And I was like, no, literally, I've got a clarinet in my face for 20 hours a week. Easy, you know, like easy. And, and my, on the weekends, like I was practicing like four or five hours a day, you know, um, all the time practicing. Looking back, I'm not sure if it was all good practice. Sure. But but that was the time kind of spent practicing. But that was also the, the idea back then was you've got to spend this amount of time. I've noticed a lot of schools don't do those practice sheets anymore. And in a way, I think it's a good thing because I often told my students too when I was teaching younger kids, like, look, I don't really want you to practice for 30 minutes. I want you to practice this until you get it right and then do it five more times, you know? And if that takes you 10 minutes, Sure but it might take you an hour, <laughs> you know? So, so put in the effort that way instead. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's really interesting with those practice sheets too. This is maybe a little bit too far of a tangent, but I, with my students, I have no expectations of them practicing actually. And maybe they would be better and maybe I would be a better teacher if I was like more adamant about them practicing more. But honestly, nowadays there's just so much stuff that kids are doing between school homework, after school activities. I have one student and she does actually do a lot of practicing, (laughs) but she's like in track, soccer, all kinds of other different things. So it's, it's just like play the clarinet, have fun playing the clarinet. You're not trying to be a professional. If, if I have a student who wants to be a professional, then we talk about 
really diligent practicing and, and really going for it. But for the majority of students, they're just there to have fun. And that's kind of my mission too, is, is minimize that frustration, foster the joy so that we can have more fun with it. I was once told too that, you know, a, a beginner practices until it's right and a professional practices until it can't go wrong. And um, that's very true. And it is also true, of course, that if you do want to become a professional, practicing till it can't go wrong is going to take time. But still, if you can get it good in three hours versus seven, it's not like the, like you just said, it's not like the person who spent seven hours is better simply for the sake of spending seven hours, you know? Yeah. In a way, why isn't music more like other sports or activities where it's kind of time-based, like the fastest person to climb this rock face, <laughs> you know? You'd think it was kind of about that too, the fastest person to pre prepare the Mozart concerto. And these people, I can envision a game show, like you're given 48 hours to prepare a piece from memory <laughs> and then go or something, you know? And, and uh, this person's the most efficient practicer out there or something like that, you know? It, because that does become important too, I guess, when you're when you're actually playing shows, I mean, getting called in at the last minute to do something, that was the piece of bad advice. <laughs> but So you're, of course, trying to instill good advice. So what would the contrast of that be? Like, what would you hope that your students are kind of left with from your philosophy 15 years, 20 years from now? Yeah, yeah. I think the next generation clarinet method is the perfect sort of vehicle for that. Uh, speaking of just pure time of practice, I strongly believe that somebody could sit down and work through like the entire Baramon or Close or whatever method that, that you're looking at and maybe even actually be worse at the end of it because if you're just playing through it and reinforcing the same mistakes over and over and over, then you're just getting better at doing things badly. And yeah, they'll definitely know the keys better and be able to move around the instrument better, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be better and it's going to take a lot of time to play through all of close <laughs> um, so with the next generation clarinet method it's a little bit different where it's it's not so many different exercises and in the main book i actually only do things in c major and a minor i have like a companion guide that has all the exercises transposed to all the keys as you get more advanced but my philosophy and, and what I teach in there is I show you really how to do the exercise as well, what to be thinking about in the long tones, how to be really listening to your sound and really adjusting and adapting and learning to play the instrument very well on really quite simple exercises so that you have those strong fundamentals for whatever actual music you want to tackle. And, and that's kind of my big belief is that we get the simplest stuff going really well, and then the hard stuff is no longer so scary, and you can actually sound good as you're playing through all of Close or Baramon. How do you keep it interesting for people doing that? Because I used to do something similar as far as, like, let's really get these basics nailed down, but I find that students were just kind of getting bored. Um, so do you introduce some, like, fun little tunes with it, or is that kind of what, it, what it's focused on? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. As the exercises themselves like take some work to to get going. Um, one of my favorite things are the the finger flexibility things, which are kind of similar to the close mechanisms, um, but they're just complicated enough that you do have to think about them. But then you do the repetitions so that you really get the hang of it and really feel comfortable. And I think that's the the way that it's unlocked for me, and that I try to get it to go for my students on these simple exercises is they are simple on the surface level. Just looking at the notes and rhythms on the page, it's chromatic scale up and down, just five notes or something, or long tones, super simple, basic stuff. But the way that you keep it interesting is by finding different layers to quality. So mm -hmm. this time I'm going to play it with the metronome and just focus on perfect, steady rhythm. This time I'm going to play it and focus on perfectly even tone. This time I'm going to play it and work on relaxed fingers. We always talk about minimal fingers, keeping the fingers close to the keys, but what about relaxed fingers or independent finger motion or just coming at it from different angles of those different fundamentals? So yeah, the music is really simple, but every repetition should feel a little bit fresh because you're focused on something different. You're deliberate practicing, right? 
Totally. And so your program, Quick Start Clarinet, it, it implies to me that it's like the start, the beginning of your kind of clarinet journey. And you even say that on your website. Um, is there a place as you go along for more advanced players to also get their kind of belated quick start or like, are you focused also down the road on people trying to, you know, get into college or whatever with their clarinet? Or is this really sort of meant for beginners who are in the first phases of their playing? When I started quick start clarinet, it was just this clarinet course and this how to read music course. And and that was kind of the original idea. I am uh, as a little teaser foreshadowing for maybe something in the distant future. I I am considering rebranding a little bit uh, and, I'll probably always keep Quick Start Clarinet because it's developed really well, but I'm thinking about maybe creating a parent company or something that's more about just like fostering joy in music. But I was really surprised because I kind of thought even the next generation clarinet method is kind of kind of intermediate focused. It starts with putting the instrument together and learning your first notes, but it picks up pretty quick. So I think it's for a beginner, it might be slightly intimidating if you don't already know how to read music it's kind of aimed at like the perfect time would be somebody who's been in band like a year or so so they kind of know some notes kind of know how to play uh, and then it can really take you off from there really great for intermediate players but what really surprised me is I was doing just sort of a promotional thing on my YouTube channel where every Monday I would go through one of the timelines in the book that's something kind of different than a traditional method book too, is that I have these timelines for your specific skill level. So you can pull that out and say, okay, this is the page and exercise I'm focusing on. This is what I'm supposed to get out of it. And then next day you do the next thing. And I was playing through it and I was playing through the intermediate timeline. And this was like a year ago. So I already had my master's, was really good at clarinet. And I was shocked by how much I improved going through the intermediate timeline and just going back to those basics and and back to the fundamentals and really playing those simple exercises and thinking about all those, those quality things. So it was designed for all levels, but kind of towards the intermediate, but having gone through it myself, I think even advanced players can really benefit a lot from it. You're totally right about the, the, sort of building blocks of music helping you play music and it actually really makes sense that that happens and I often try to explain that to students like they'll be surprised because I come to a music workshop and they just hand me their piece and I can just play it and like honestly it's not that hard it's like we're talking junior high high school music which is sometimes a bit challenging but I mean I can sight read like 99% of it I would say you know um but they're always like wow like, how did how did you do that are you like are you magic basically and I'm like well I'm, you know that scale we tried to go through at the beginning and y'all were like, oh, I don't like it. Well, if you do the scales enough, that run is the scale. It just starts on the third note and ends on the one. Like it, if you start to see the patterns, it's like the matrix. Oh, there goes a there goes a B flat minor chord. You know, like, whatever. Um, it's what it starts to feel like. Like you look at the music and all the patterns. Not only do you recognize them visually, but you recognize them from a muscle memory standpoint too. And you can just kind of do it. And that's, I think, the goal is to reach that sort of fluidity. And then it doesn't matter what piece is put in front of you. You can just sort of, you can interpret it. And that's, I think, the goal of a musician is to be able to, you know, interpret or compose or improvise music, right? Yeah, yeah. I think the music part is important (laughs) at (laughs) some point along the way. So this is kind of a tangent. But you're talking about kind of your goals and your your parent company and, and... all this stuff. And I remember a few days ago, we when we connected before this call to kind of set it up, you were talking about your no spend year or something like that, which I thought was a very interesting concept. And I also tried to go a more kind of frugal route this year, not entirely just to not spend money, but just because of you know, we've got two kids now and the clutter of life just really starts to add up. And you also start to look at the things you're using, like some plastic crap. And I'm just like, this is just going to get used by me for a couple of months go into a landfill for the next thousand years or whatever. And it's just a waste, you know, and it's also, I worked for that money. I bought that stupid thing and now it's gone and it's all just for naught, you know, and it caused damage to the earth in the process and made some poor person in a factory work somewhere to make make this, you know, it's just, when you look at the ecosystem, I, I have a book called the high cost of low price. And it talks about like the problems that are caused by the pursuit of the lowest price all the time. And our current market. But anyway, what does your no spend year kind of look like? And what got you into this? Was it similar? Yeah, yeah. So before I forget, there's something that I heard about kind of along those lines of 
like our impact on the environment and, and the ecosystem. And it's called Donut Economics. I mm-hmm. can't remember the author or much more about it, but it's this idea that we have a limit. We shouldn't be going for maximum economic growth all the time, every single year, year over year, because we eventually end up burning out our resources that way. So there's sort of a sweet spot donut where if you're in the middle and like below the poverty line and life's hard there, we have that sweet spot in the donut. And then once we try to expand beyond that, then we're just burning unnecessary resources. And that's a a little bit of the motivation behind it. Uh, Another part of it is I have a cousin getting married in New Zealand at the end of this year. So we're sort of saving up money for, for that trip. But it really is coming from that idea of like, we have everything to live a comfortable life. So we don't need to be mindlessly consuming anymore. We can really just appreciate what we have and, and go from there. And we certainly are spending money on things and, and still getting stuff that we want. But the nice thing about the, the no spend year is kind of similar to deliberate practice where it's deliberate buying <laughs> instead of just saying, yeah. oh, I need a new X, Y, or Z, throw it in the Amazon cart, get it here in two days, have it break in a month or two, and then get another one. <laughs> instead of doing that, we sit there and think, well, we don't want to be spending money this year. We're trying to, to limit the spending. So do we really need this? Is this something that is absolutely necessary? Do we already have something that serves this function and just being deliberate about where our money is going? That last point is so so valid for most people. I mean, I set a goal too, and it sounds like a lot of items, but you build up a lot of clutter. Like I said, I'm trying to get rid of 100 things, sell 100 things, and use up 100 things. And when I say a hundred things, like I'm not like rolling in stuff around here, but like just in my desk, I've probably got three or four cases of, uh, you know, reeds or a couple boxes of guitar strings, like just make a point of, okay, I'm going to use up that set of strings this year. I'm going to, I'm going to use those reeds. And when you do that a hundred times, you've really reduced the clutter and you've also reduced the need to spend because you've, you're kind of keeping up with activities. Um, and you know, the nice thing too, about the giving away is it's stuff that like, I, I don't want to, I'm not really using but I can find it a new home and give it kind of a new life or donate it to charity or, or whatever. And again, I'm talking, it could be small things. Like I've got maybe, let's say four pairs of scissors, give three away, you know, and I'm counting that. So I'm keeping track. I'm doing pretty well on my sheet. Um, it's kind of fun, actually, too. Not to mention the selling one. I mean, you find all kinds of stuff around the house. It's like, wait a minute, I'm not really using that. I wonder if I just put it online for 10 bucks and someone can come pick it up and it's better than nothing and it's better than the space it's taking up in my mind, you know, in my life. Um, but an interesting thing has happened. I'm not even halfway through all those sheets, but my mind feels a lot freer and I'm able to like focus on working on some of the music I'm doing and the podcast a little bit better. And I'm still super busy, but I'm filling this, the space in my life that stuff was taking up with activities and projects and things like not non-physical things. (laughs) You know what I mean? So it's such an interesting kind of anti-consumerist approach and like you i am spending money I, i'm surely spending money but i'm thinking about the spending of the money and um did you set like a very strict budget at first and try and just stick to that or what did you kind of do yeah what we did is we sort of categorized expenses where we have things like that are are green spending things where it's, it's okay to spend money on this like if we have to do a house repair like we have to spend the money right uh yeah. and then we have some budgets for like food, groceries, uh, date night kind of monthly budgets. And then we have our no spend stuff, which is like new clothes, electronics, video games, uh, those kinds of things where it's just like, we have a lot of those. We're, we're really satisfied with those things. Uh, we don't need to, to go crazy there. Um, so when, and then I track each month, like, what was our green spending? What was our budget spending? What was our red no spend stuff? And and trying to get that no spend to as close to zero every month as possible. It's very similar to what I tried. And uh, I say tried because I haven't quite achieved it every month. However, you have to be mindful sometimes of under budgeting. And what I mean by that is I set a, a number in my mind that I thought would be reasonable for groceries. I was way off. Like even if you just <laughs> if, if you just think for a second about what it should cost to feed four people a day, um, even if it's only $5 a person per day, that's $20 a day, that's $600 a month. 
right? That's only $5 a person. That's not much. And so I originally set our grocery budget to like $500 a month. And I was like, why am I, why am I having so much trouble hitting this? And it's like, well, I can't live off $3 a day for three meals for three people or four people. You know, it's unreasonable. So you have to set a reasonable budget. So I've since kind of retweaked it a bit. And, but you know what? We didn't go over by much. And I thought it was so interesting because I'm like, even though I failed, I didn't spend so much you know, that I, that I would have otherwise spent simply because just like you're saying, I was thinking about it. And, um, do you find also you've had more time now that you're kind of doing this, what do you call it? Reduced spending or reduced, uh, I guess just budgeting maybe, but yeah, like, uh, the no, the no spend year, like, are you able to focus on your content better too? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really interesting. Uh, first I want to bring up the, like failing at the budget. I think that's also so, apt for the comparison to deliberate practice too, because that's a big point of deliberate practice is making the mistakes and and inventorying the mistakes. And you realize that, yeah, maybe the budget wasn't quite right. So I failed, but you learned something from it. Uh, And I think that's true for music, for budgets, for business, for everything. Like as long as you're learning from the failures, you're you're getting something out of it and and getting a benefit out of it and yeah that's that's absolutely true for practice in every way too do you find that you've also learned to be more frugal with your time yeah yeah it's and that's kind of part of the the no spend philosophy too is that it's it is really taking into account what's important and what's not important. Uh, I think last time I was on the podcast, I recommended the book Essentialism by uh, yes. Greg McEwen, I think. And it's the same idea, like what is important, what isn't important. And it's interesting too with the no spend thing, how when we aren't so worried about the physical things, we lean into the experiences more. So instead of going out and spending money doing whatever, I have to be creative and and do new things like, oh, let's pull out this board game that we have, but have never played or, or something like that. And uh, it's, I I forget where I heard this. It might've been in like one of the no spend your videos that I was watching, uh, going into this and learning about it. But when you get to the end of your life, you never think, oh, I remember that whatever I bought that one year that was just so exciting. Maybe there's like one or two things that were really meaningful purchases in your life. But what you're remembering and and looking back on fondly is the experiences you had with people. And and that's the stuff that, that really matters. So worrying less about the physical stuff, more about the experiences and the connections and all that stuff is really makes a difference in just general happiness, I think. Totally. I don't want to get into a whole like life coaching episode here, but we almost (laughs) could, you know, I guess. But I I had a similar kind of goal setting this year. I was very sick for a few months. And at the end of it, um, I kind of also decided like I I, I don't want to be just more frugal with my money for the sake of frugality. Like I actually don't really believe in frugality all that much. But it was more about that. Like it's not that I want to be frugal. I want to choose where the money goes better, you know. So yeah, if you cut back, $500 $500 of expenses, let's say, you can put that into $500 of something you actually want. And it's amazing how quick that adds up. I called my cell phone company. Am I really on the best plan? $20 savings a month, $204 a year, you know, called the gym. Oh, I don't really need the plus membership anymore. $20 a month. Now we're at $40 a month. You do that 10 times. It's amazing what you can achieve. And, um, it's, it's really interesting too, then, because like, like you say, you can pursue those experiences or maybe you can experience online lessons with quick, quick start clarinet or, or, or whatever, you know, you can put your money into something that you really want to be doing. Um, so yeah, I think that's so interesting, but I actually, with my goal setting, like I was going to say, I usually set goals. Like I want to get 24 podcast episodes out. I want to, you know, practice clarinet every day or whatever, but I set different goals. I was like, I want to do 24 really unique events with my kids. And I look at my chart every month and I'm like, okay, I got to do two things a month. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it actually is a lot to, to plan like a little whatever. And so some months we went skating on a Saturday and went for lunch afterwards. And I count that another weekend, maybe we go to a wave pool or we go away to a, it's just making the intent to do something like that. Um, you, you could set a goal. Like I want to perform once a month, the whole year. It doesn't matter the venue. I just want to get out there and do it. So just planning experiences in part of your goals and not just, stuff or activities that are kind of just fruitless you know 
Yeah. And it's gotten really deep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, well, dude, next episode will be our life whew. coaching episode. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Today on the uh, life coaching podcast with <laughs> Sean and Josh. Yeah. It's true, though. I think, well, I think a lot of people, though, kind of went into this sort of um, self help almost genre over the pandemic. Like, it was a really lonely, weird time, I think, for a lot of people. And I've noticed even with like Amazon recommendations and things, you browse a couple of those kind of books and then it's all you see <laughs> all the time. But I think I read that essentialism though, because you, you recommended it to me or, or we happened to read it around the same time or something. That's a great book. So if you're listening, you should check out essentialism by whatever that guy's name was. I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right yeah. I think it's Greg McEwen. I'm pretty sure. Don't ask me how to spell it though. <laughs> That's right. But yeah. That book was recommended to me by the Acropolis Reed Quintet. So it's, Mm. a good one. Oh, that, you know what? Maybe yeah. that's why I heard about it was Carrie Landry because she came Could on be. the show and then I think that you also a couple people recommended that. I have kind of a rule unwritten that if I hear about a book two or three times like I got to read it cuz you know, if that many people are like, yeah, this is my favorite book currently or it's got to be worth reading, you know. So speaking of things to choose to invest your money in wisely, um, I wasn't joking about quick, quick Start Clarinet. As you can tell, Josh has some great ideas. It's a great resource. And you know what? We can actually save you a bit of, bit of money on your membership, too, with that. So we've got a code. Clarinet is the code, right? Mm-hmm. Clarinet 15. Clarinet 15. So the, the letters or the numbers, I suppose, 1-5. Clarinet 1-5. That will get you actually 15% off any um, of Josh's courses, everything but the one-on-one coaching on his website. So if you are interested in signing up for that, um, you can go ahead and do that. And uh, who knows, maybe we'll cross-promote some of this stuff. So I'll just let any of Josh's listeners know as well that if you are, or you know what, if you're a Clarinet listener too, you can also use this coupon. It's a secret coupon that I will put on this episode only. (laughs) If you want to be able to tune into future episodes of Clarinet Live and save 10% while you're doing it, what did we say the code was? Quick10? Quick10? That will get you 10% off as a Josh Goo Quick Start Clarinet fan. Um, or if you want to just get your 30 days, first 30 days free and just try Clarinet first, you can use uh, just code QUICK. And I'll put the links to those in the description of this video. So extra bonus today. We're talking about saving and there you go. <laughs> that'll, that'll be one way to, to do that for yourself. But um, great. So Josh, this was a really great conversation this was just what i needed today because i was kind of uh this was sort of a burnout day for me i woke up and i was like oh my god there's so much to do and then i was like i gotta settle into this call and have a really great great talk with josh so um how do you handle those kind of days when you're just like man i got so much content to create i got so much work to do where, where do you where do you start what do you do yeah that's that's a fun one so there's a couple of reasons why it happens. This is kind of my my philosophy to problem solving anything, whether it's in a student's playing or my personal life. Uh, I like to think about the success formula, which I learned from Dean Graziosi, who's like a business marketing coach. And the success formula is you get clarity on the end result that you want. You get honesty with where you're currently at. And usually when you have those things, the next step forward is is pretty clear. So That's one thing that I think is really valuable to do is just sit down. Okay, I I wake up. I don't feel like doing anything. I just spent 20, 30, 60 minutes sitting on Facebook or TikTok or just scrolling away. And I think, okay, I need to actually do something with my life. (laughs) The first thing I do is... (laughs) what is the goal? Like, what, what can I be clear on that I want to achieve? What's something I can do today to minimize frustration, foster joy and and get people doing music more. So just having that kind of idea is sort of your, your motive, what we're, what we're here for, what the purpose is. And then after that, it's just about getting into motion and doing something, even if it's just a a little something, uh, getting from the couch, to the office chair uh, is usually enough to sort of start getting the the ball rolling. And then the one other thing too, with when it comes to problems and, and solving problems, there's the success formula is one thing that I like to think about clarity motive. The other thing is finding the root of the problem. Same thing when I'm teaching clarinet, if somebody's having grunts and thuds on their upper clarion articulation, is it the tongue too firm or is it the airs not supporting well enough or is it the embouchures too tight? What is the actual root of the problem? And most of the time, it's some kind of mental thing of, 
oh, the upper clarion notes are hard, so I have to try harder to get them out. And then subconsciously, the embouchure's tightening, the air's weakening, the tongue's getting heavier. Uh, so we have to really get down to like, what's the root of the problem? And for me, it's what's the root of the problem when I'm feeling unmotivated? Most of the time, it's because I'm scrolling through social media and seeing all of the crazy stuff happening in the world. So I put that away, put on something positive, maybe a course of like other people's courses or other people's motivational stuff or find a, a YouTube video that's motivational and not terrifyingly bad about everything bad happening <laughs> and then get some positive stuff coming in, into my brain and that usually helps to turn it around for me. You're right. I just realized one reason I'm so stressed the last 14 days, I, I'm busy. I got two kids. I'm busy. I got lots on my plate. But I, I just realized that I've given an inordinate amount of time and energy to the media lately, which I have not done for three years. I, I've basically turned off the news at the start of the pandemic and never turned it on again. But for some reason, I was very compelled about this whole Titan sub thing. I found it just so tragic and bizarre and, and just the whole narrative around it is so strange. And I've, I've really been roped into it. Like I find I'm thinking about it a lot. I'm watching a lot of quite honestly, stupid content about it. And, uh, yeah, yeah I think I got to dial that back, <laughs> but uh, essentialism, is that really truly important? But you know, yeah, that's yeah. exactly, that's exactly what it is. And you know, we talked about frugality of time a little bit, and that's something that people need to be smarter about, you know, like I even read something recently and and this is ironic, but I, uh, I don't remember where I read it, but it was saying something like, you got to be careful even how much of this kind of content you consume, because if you're always focused on improvement, like self-improvement, you're never focused on deepening your knowledge. And so you have all these strengths and abilities to handle these great things, but you've, you've sharpened the saw, so to speak, and it's so sharp. But there's no wood to cut. There's no cabins to build. <laughs> like you got nothing to do with all this this refined ability. So you got to make sure to add some kind of meat to those potatoes or something, whatever way you want to put it, you know. And I was like, that's very true. I'm reading a few too many books like Essentialism and maybe not enough about you know deep music topics or whatever else, you know. And um, so, or even just practicing, you know, you, you find yourself in these kind of moments reading and. And it's like, you know, I could be working on, you know, my songwriting right now or my clarinet or my whatever, you know, actually physically the doing instead of just the, the refining of the skills to be doing, if that makes sense, <laughs> getting yeah. in the moment. So I also love how practicing turns my day around. I sort of yes. set up my practice ritual and routine where I always start with my three-step warm-up of long tones, technique, articulation, and just sort of finding my sound on the instrument. Uh, that's another going back to the uh, discussion from earlier about we always think professionals just like have it all together, but I think everyday professionals have to find their sound, get the fingers moving and, and all that good stuff. And sitting down to do that just brings my awareness to the moment. I treat long tones almost as a meditation where I'm just fully aware of how I feel, how the sound is shaping the sound the way that I want. And that always turns my day around and, and gets my mind in a more present and positive state. Well, they say that music and doing music physically like rewires your brain and, and releases dopamine and all these things. And so, yeah, I'd, I've experienced that too, where, you know, you're having kind of a busy day, a rough day or whatever, and just getting an instrument in your hands for a few minutes. And for me, it could be, I play many things, but it's not always clarinet, but maybe it's my guitar or, or whatever, but just even listening to music for a few minutes as an isolated activity can really just kind of, okay, help you out in that way. And it really kind of smooths over any <laughs> roughness in your day and, and things like that. So Great stuff, Josh. I'm really pleased to see where your YouTube channel is going. I think it's, what is it, five times bigger than last time we talked? Maybe 10 or eight times at least. So if that happens again, we will be having a lot more to talk about, I'm sure, as far as your sort of mu musical scalability journey and your, your career as an online you know, teacher and educator. And I really wish you the best of luck on all those things. Don't forget, as a Clarinet listener, you can save 15% on Josh's programs at, at uh, quickstartclarinet.com with code clarinet15, all one word, word and then numbers. And uh, for, for <laughs> quick start listeners, you can save 10% on clarinet ongoing with code quick10 if you'd like to check that out as well. We'd love to see you in the clarinet community and vice versa. So any last words, Josh, before we, before we go? 
yeah, just thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's always fun to, to talk about the stuff that we, we come up with and, and all the good tangents. And uh, I love the, the different directions of the show. Uh, another quick tangent. I heard on, I think it was the John Burra episode where you mentioned in your uh, survey that you sent out uh, that some people said that you talk too much and, and don't let the interviewer talk, <laughs> talk enough. Uh, but personally, I love your contributions to the, the podcast and the little anecdotes and story so keep talking and and thanks so much for making an awesome clarinet podcast oh thank you i appreciate that and you know what it's it's funny I, i've learned to take that survey and others like it kind of with a grain of salt because you know what else people said they wanted i did a few hundred a few hundred people replied to that survey which was great but most of them said they wanted video and a significant portion of them said that they would would be willing to or wanted to have access to actually come in on the conversations and would even be willing to pay for the video and this thing so those out there, the video is free. <laughs> the video is free, but it still is costing money to produce and takes a lot more time. Um, and this live stuff is now available. Please take advantage of this. I've priced it at like, for students, you can get a discount. Contact me at hello at clarinet.com. Um, but it's like the price of a cup of coffee per episode. So I, I really think that if you're a clarinetist, you want to get value from people like Josh and all the other great guests that are coming on here, join me here. It's it's going to be great. We're having a lot of you know conversations with, with really great people. And I do. I like Josh. I want to build community around the clarinet a bit and not just have it be on Facebook. You know, I want people to be here um, and actually interacting with the guests. So, yeah, this has been really great. I, I hope to talk to you again soon. I know I'll be talking to I don't know. Actually, I think I'll be talking to Michelle soon. We've been kind of in the in the conversation. Michelle Anderson, who uh, actually you've been working with, too. Maybe we will touch on that next time. But uh, always an open invitation here on Clarinet. And thanks again for coming on the program today. Yeah, thanks, Sean. The Clarinet Podcast is brought to you in part by one of my favorite products ever, Bova the Two-Way Humidity Control Packs. I live in a super dry and cold climate in Canada, and so taking care of my instruments is a real challenge. However, it's effortless with Bovida. Every three months, I just replace the Bovida pack in my case, and I know my clarinets will be comfy and cozy inside. If you use cane reeds, there's also a mini version that fits inside most reed cases and keeps your reeds at their best, so they're ready to play when you are. Check out Bovida's offerings for clarinetists at bovidainc.com and use code CLARINET at checkout to save 10% on your next purchase. Click the link in the description below to learn more.